धीमहि यन्न सत्ये न दीपये तत्सवितुर्वर रूप ज्योति पर धीम यन्न सत्य नीपय 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 so welcome everyone let us start so we'll take an overlap uh, from page 78 78 starting from a thinking being in an unthinking world so anyone who feels ready we can read the lines okay let's start yeah yeah please yeah. a thinking being in an unthinking world an island in the sea of the unknown he is a smallness trying to be great an animal with some instincts of a god his life a story too common to be told his deeds a number summing up to naught his consciousness a torch lit to be quenched his hope a star above a cradle and grave 
Yeah, Ravi ji, is there an audio problem at your end? Because we can't hear you at all. Yeah, we can't hear you. Although I see the mic going up and down, but I can't hear anything. Yeah, now it was, it just came for a second and then went away. I think if you're using earphones, maybe if you could plug them right, I don't know what's the issue. Okay, so I can continue. Yeah, yeah, you continue. And if Raviji on the way, if you get okay with the audio, you can go ahead. Yes, Taru, please. And yet a greater destiny may be his, for the eternal spirit is his truth. He can recreate himself and all around and fashion new the world in which he lives. He, ignorant, is the knower beyond time. He is the self above nature above fate his soul retired from all that he had done hushed was the futile din of human toil forsaken wheeled the circle of the days in distance sank the crowded tramp of life the silence was his soul companion left impassive he lived immune from earthly hopes a figure in the ineffable witnesses shrine pacing the vast cathedral of his thoughts under its arches dim with infinity and heavenward brooding of invisible wings. A call was on him from intangible heights, indifferent to the little outpost mind. He dwelled, he dwelt in the wideness of the eternal's reign. Yeah, thank you. So we stopped here. And we were just looking at Sri experience of this expansion of consciousness, uh, his being stretching out and this wideness that he experiences. So we'll just take an overlap with the previous lines and then we'll take up the new lines. The silence was his sole companion left. Impassive, he lived immune from earthly hopes. You know, immunity is a word uh, which we often use in uh, science when, you know, when we talk of vaccinations. And when we say that I am immune to this disease, it means that it cannot touch you. That disease cannot touch you. So impassive, he lived immune from earthly hopes. <laughs> it's very interesting you know, that we, our life usually just walks around hopes and disappointments and then another hope and then another disappointment. But here uh, it's possible for us to reach a state of being which in Hindi say for example we call disenchanted or jivan mukt or udasin where you are seated above all this drama of earthly hopes and disappointments. So now he's immune, you know, now they cannot touch. Uh, earthly hopes can't touch. They, they, he knows that they can't give me anything that I'm really craving for. So impassive. And again, uh, when we talk about passion, you know, the way we live passionately in life. So although mother says that even passions are preferable to dull inertia, and yet uh, there comes a stage where we have to transcend our passions also. Because if we go to the root of passion word, it means to suffer. <laughs> it's very strange when we look at the etymology. So passion means suffering. And we see that whenever we are passionate about anything, yes, of course, it brings us a lot of joy and delight. 
but when we are not able to follow that passion then it brings us a lot of disappointment also we suffer when i am not able to follow the passion so now he is impassive these ups and downs and sways and sorrows and disappointments and happinesses they can't touch him now he is transcended above that earthly sense mind impassive he lived immune so he's got this immunity now what we call divine immunity that the supreme immunity is when you are united with the divine consciousness that's the supreme immunity no vaccination no no life insurance can give us this immunity a figure in the ineffable witnesses shrine facing the vast cathedral of his thoughts so he's just become so wide and expansive you know when we stabilize ourselves in this witnessing consciousness stands who am i i am this consciousness which is the witness of all the ups and downs and ups and downs and that is one consciousness in all it's not like there is my consciousness your consciousness no it's like a continuity and that's why we say that the divine is one in all this consciousness is one in all and that's the witnessing consciousness so often it is compared with space because your how the house uh, in which you live you may think that that's a separate space and my house is a separate space but if we look then the space has a continuity you know it's a never ending vastness so that's how we can refer also to the divine consciousness it's a never ending illimitable vastness and the more he uh, grew in this uh, consciousness the more higher he saw that it goes you know it's like fathomless and the highs are just one can go on and on and on just like when we go into the universe into the outer space we see that we never find an end of the universe we can always go on and on and on and on and on you know as per our capacity there is no end nobody has ever found an end to the universe why one can wonder because the divine also is infinite and as the creation is in the image of the divine and even so called limited beings like us you know i am a mortal being you are a mortal being although we may seem very limited from the outer surface but we know all of us know that the deeper we go in our being we see that there is no end to this you know depth we can just go on and on and on how how again paradoxical that on the appearance the body appears so limited the body appears limited okay here i start and here i end but there is no end when we begin to go inward there is no end we can go on and on and on fathomless depths and rich with potential it's not that they are empty they they seem empty but they are rich with intuitive potential a call was on him so he's called ashupati is called uh, have you ever you know felt a call <laughs> even in day to day uh, issues you know at times it happens that we feel called so maybe we meet a person we feel called to interact with the person maybe there is a job that comes up and again we feel called to apply so there is a call there is no maybe no logical reason to that call but we know that there is something which is calling me so a call was on him from intangible heights indifferent to the little outpost mind so usually the way we are in our ordinary consciousness we operate from this uh, sense mind whatever sense input i receive that's what the mind which is the sixth sense it interprets according to my conditioning and that's what i believe in i create a judgment i create an opinion around it so that's my outpost mind it's like a person standing out there you know making sense of everything so now he is completely ignoring these inputs and when we are for example in our day to day life and we are trying to bring mind home or keep mind home in the body you know for example focusing on our breath bringing the mind home in the body in the present moment many a times we struggle most of the times we struggle because there are so many thoughts and past stories and present commentary that calls us <laughs> so we also have a call no one can say that i have a call that all these story lines call me <laughs> so 
so that would be on a funny note but he had a, a higher call and i think all of us have a higher call it may be sooner or later and we are all looking for that lasting satisfaction lasting contentment lasting joy a joy that never fades away so we do have a call but we don't maybe much pay a heed to it so now he's indifferent to these storylines that go in the mind because he gives them no importance it doesn't mean anything i think it's a very beautiful stage if we reach that in this lifetime to not to take our thoughts and judgments and opinions and feelings and all that the mind thinks and comments about uh, to be very light about it first of all it adds a bit of humor in life and secondly uh, i i i don't get stuck again and again at these levels which are actually they're nothing they not even they can't be even called little windows because the reality is just the little mind cannot conceive it so he is now indifferent i'm just taking this overlap again we did discuss these lines last time indifferent to the little outpost mind he dwelt in the wideness of the eternal's reign so when i stop identifying with the little 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 windows i automatically get identified with the eternal seamless and formless and vast because i am not allowing myself this is where the personal effort mother and shri aurobindo say of the sadhak is required to con- continuously be on guard vigilance as mother says be sincere be vigilant and to continuously disengage from the surface commentary so that's the that's where the effort is required because like an old habit uh, it's my habit to continuously engage with the surface commentary and believe it to be true and it has nothing true really in it so and that's why we are always mostly at clash with each other because for other person something else is true and for me this is true and we are both sticking to our ideas we think that we are different but we are not because we are both sticking so <laughs> so two sticky people just always are in clash with each other you know bandhe ko bandha mila chhute ko an upay there is a couplet from kabir kar bandhagi nirbandh ki pal mein le chudai so he says that one who is bonded met another one who is bonded and now who will take them apart now they are entangled in this conflict or maybe we can call love but it's actually a conflict very soon it changes into a conflict and he says who will take care of you who will resolve this knot that you have created uh, by by being a slave of the one who is unbonded kar bandhagi nirbandh ki one who is not bonded when we are slave to that one referring to the divine i assume because in our ignorance all of us are tied then something can be resolved so we will see that two people even if they can have a good bond or a good friendship it can only happen when they are both slaves of truth and not slaves of each other because if we are slaves of each other then sooner we have poison in our life which all of us know how it is so yeah so this is where we stopped any uh, thoughts here we will take up new lines later after this any thoughts anyone the uh, meditation that you had shared in the morning mm-hmm. you know how the rupert spira he had said that how can one wave you know find true solace in another wave yeah you know, it just so it was so visual right that it's so temporary it's just a small movement it's just a wave and it will merge back in the ocean and how to actually find that completeness one has to get in the depths like the wave cannot help the wave even yet our whole lives yeah is to find that wave that will help me you know <laughs> become the ocean like it's mm-hmm. pretty funny if we look at it the thing is the sad thing is we don't look at it right yeah. we just keep yeah and this you know a call was on him from intangible height like it's i don't know if it i think it is related you know at the a month or two kind of before you know i had that near death experience like when i would do my whatever you know the morning meditation or anything like i would 
hear myself saying that I am ready. Like I would, you mm. know, when I'm ending, the last thing would be this sentence coming from me that I'm ready. Ready for what? I don't know. Mm. You know, like it yeah. made no sense. It didn't come after that. It, it wasn't from the beginning. But you know how this indifferent, like I don't know what was what it was. And yes, something mm. had to say I'm ready. So it just reminded me of, yeah, that. thank you. Yes, thank you. So we will go ahead, if not anything. Yeah, anyone who would like to go eat? His being now exceeded thinkable space. His boundless thought was neighbor to cosmic sight. A universal light was in his eyes. A golden influx flowed through heart and brain. A force came down into his mortal limbs. A current from eternal seas of bliss. He felt the invasion and the nameless joy. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad that you can <laughs> speak now. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah. you were speaking earlier yeah, also, yeah. but yeah. it was not yeah. audible. Thank, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> So this can be a meditative line, actually. His being, all these lines are meditative equally. His being now exceeded thinkable space. So, I think many people have actually made use of such uh, and such a visualization, like closing our eyes and imagining ourselves, maybe going out of earth and looking at the earth from the outer space. And then going even further and further away and maybe towards the sun. And again, looking at all the planets from that distance and then even extending oneself beyond 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 to galaxies and meteorites or whatever so that's thinkable space and it is the power of thought that we can do this visualization you know, so you see the subtleness the body is not for all of us, uh, most for most of us, the body is not that subtle, although we can, in subtle physical, we may have our adventures, but I, at this moment, as a mortal being like me, I cannot imagine that, okay, I can reach if just by a thought, I reach Jupiter. No, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm sure people can do that, but uh, I can't do that, right? But in my thoughts and feelings, I can go really far and wide. So that's the subtlety, how from the physical consciousness, then life came, feelings, and then thought came. And that's why when we talk about my man being a mental being, that's where the subtilization of consciousness is that if I think right now, I can be at Jupiter. And many people have very good imagery that they can actually be at Jupiter and visualize what's happening and what is the color and uh, although not going there today, but staying on earth today for the purpose of Savitri. But uh, yes, we can extend ourselves. We, so this, this is the thinkable space that we can go far, far, far. We can stretch. And this actually is a very beautiful visualization because it helps us expand our view. So for example, if I have emotional pain today or somebody said something, I'm feeling sad. You know, so I, and I, if I do this visualization, where I take myself in vast, you know, outer space and maybe beyond galaxies, then in front of that, my pain doesn't, you know, appear anything valid. It just disappears. It's like, it's a good distraction. And mother says that one must distract actually in into the higher and the lofty. Uh, and that really, really helps because when we are too much concentrated, me, my story, people are not talking to me or I'm not getting this, then it becomes very, very heavy. So when we can, in the moments when we can, and if we do this visualization, it really expands our being, expands our thoughts. 
you know, and then our trouble doesn't appear like that burdensome. So his being, Ashwapati's whole being, now exceeded thinkable space. So not only just the thought, but also the being just like expanded beyond what the body uh, cage allows. His boundless thought was neighbor to cosmic sight. So Sri Aurobindo talks about having a mind which is mind should be trained in such a manner that it should become very flexible, vast, supple. That it's not that we are talking to each other and we have a clash and then we stop talking and then we talk after one year because you know we had a trouble. Usually that happens with many of us at many stages in our life that oh you did not agree with me and that's why I stopped talking. So the, the mind has to become so vast and supple that even if there are two conflicting, seemingly conflicting point of views, one is able to have a reflection over it and to be able to synthesize it, even the opposing points of view and to see that yes, both are having a ground. So there is something there which can be seen. So his boundless thought was neighbor to cosmic sight. Cosmic sight is all inclusive, right? So it's like a cosmic vision. I see all in the creation and beyond. A universal light was in his eyes. So I want to share on this universal light something which came to me and I thought uh, the moment I heard universal light, this picture of Sri came to me. Because this is, I think, right after when he was out of Alipur jail, he had all the darshan of Sri Krishna and the revelation. And just look at this light in his eyes. So I was reminded of this light when I read these lines. It's a very meditative picture that we have. As if he's looking, you know, maybe far beyond and across and into the vastness. So, a universal light was in his eyes, a golden influx flowed through heart and brain. So he's still uh, connected with his physical consciousness. It's not that whenever we are in meditative experiences, you know, we go high above in the spirit and then we lose touch with the body. So Shadavan was also sharing that throughout his, ex his experiences, he's totally connected with the earth element. He's connected with the body. And that's where Mother and Shurabindu's integral yoga is that we need to have this transformation of this very body, which is our temple, which is our house. Not to reach some greater revelations and heights and leave the body as it is, leave the thought and the feeling as it is. So a golden influx flowed through heart and brain, physical heart and brain. Just like last time Sardaji was sharing you know, that how when his father was uh, remembering the mother and he was uh, wanting some strength in his arms and hands, he got that, you know, he felt that energy flow through his limbs. So a force came down into his mortal limbs, a current from eternal seas of bliss, he felt the invasion and the nameless joy. And this is Sri Aurobindo's own experience, which he has also uh, shared in his sonnet called Golden Light. I'm going to share it with all of us. Give me a moment. Yeah. So would anyone want to read this sonnet by Sri Aurobindo? It's exactly referencing to the lines that we were reading. The golden light, thy golden light came down into my brain and the gray rooms of mind sun touched became a reply sorry a bright reply to wisdom's occult plane a calm illumination and a flame thy golden light came down into my throat and all my speech 
is now a tune divine a peen song of the my single note my words are drunk with the immortal wine thy golden light came down into my heart smiting my life with thy eternity now has it grown a temple where thou art and all its passion point towards only thee thy golden light came down into my feet my earth is now thy play field and thy seat yeah thank you so much even in god's labor there is some golden light mentioned right i think it's yes. in the first star i said yes yes, yes, yes. So this can be a very uh, good meditation for those of us interested and it's like connecting with our source and from top to bottom one is drenched in that light the light of grace the divine force and i found these lines also very beautiful now has it grown a temple where thou art and all its passions point only towards thee so when we refer it with our scattered consciousness sometimes i'm in the morning i want this in the evening i want the divine <laughs> you know in the towards the night i want something else not not like that now there is a unification in the being and one knows what one wants so all the passions are turned only towards the divine and mother uh, in her words she says that never take any support anywhere but in the divine and then she says towards the end because if you do that if you don't do that then you often get disappointed you fall very badly and you fall so badly at times that it hurts your nose something like that so now complete backing or banking is on the divine completely one is turned completely again would refer back to what earlier we were reading disenchanted you know knowing that the earthly existence the way it is right now it cannot bring me that fulfillment that i am looking for so why not turn to the source of supreme fulfillment why to take so much of time when once we have suffered enough have it, have enough experiences for us to get convinced why to still bang our heads on the walls here and there so now has it grown a temple where thou art and for this temple to be created in each one of us one has to purify constant purification of the being has to be there you know whatever is ugly as mother says you know pick it up with like a forceps and throw it out reject it from the being only keeps which is worthy of keeping just like you clean a temple you don't keep the temple dirty you know we we keep the slippers outside and it's a metaphorical meaning also that i don't want to get all the dirt inside and mind is a temple thought is temple feelings are a temple you know ill will good will this is all this has to be purified only then we can with lots of effort it doesn't come easy to anyone each one of us even avatars when they come if we read their stories so much of effort they have to put to before they realize that what that what is the mission they have if you if you read the story of avatar meher baba there also we see that so much of effort before there is a full realization of the mission and purpose so effort is to you know has to be there and instead of putting our effort in pleasing others and all the you know other things where in our manipulations agendas this person said this thing and in the morning and before five years and instead of all that drainage of energy we can put up our energy here in constant disengagement from the surface consciousness and engaging with the divine name and bringing the mind home so this is like a complete the full purification of the being where each part of one's being is full of the divine presence so this would be again in regard with what the the lines that we were reading yeah 
a force came down into his mortal limbs a current from eternal seas of bliss he felt the invasion and the nameless joy so i want to again uh, share something which i thought it would be a good point to reflect upon through the lines of savitri this vastness that he talks about here his being now exceeded thinkable space his boundless thought was neighbor to cosmic sight so since shorobindo talks about having a mind which is so vast so supple and we can have many many visualizations on this actually we can create our own when we are expanding our thought and really going far 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 from our limits i remember in one workshop many years ago dr anand reddy in pondicherry he gave this example where he said that we were sitting in a room Taru was also there. Taru, you may remember this anecdote that I'm sharing right now. And if you feel like adding something to that, uh, so he said that uh, he was talking about these ranges of mind that are there, like the higher mind, the illumined mind, the intuitive mind, the super mind, the over mind. You know these ranges that Shyamavindu describes. So he said that, see, look, we are all sitting here having this workshop in this room. Now, if somebody asks me. what is higher mind what is over mind and you keep sitting in this room so it is impossible for me to share with you what is over mind and higher mind well you keep sitting in this room and he referred to the ocean outside because in pondicherry we have ocean next and where sakar is at the 2 minutes of a walk and you are next to the ocean so he said that if you want to look at the ocean which is the higher mind illumined mind or any range of higher range of mind that you may name you will have to go out of this room and experience for yourself so that's how he explained that what we do is that we keep sitting in this room the sense mind that we have all the inputs from the science sense mind this is what i heard this is what i felt and then interpreting you know the mind layers of interpretation the mind gives so with that outpost mind which we were reading earlier we cannot have uh, the access to higher mind illumined mind intuitive mind you know all those things even if, if we have access it will come only in glimpses and then we'll be back to our limited mind so you will have to make the effort to go out of this room he said and go look at what is the possibility that's how you can reach or access these higher possibilities so we will and that's where uh, i think i can relate this with mother and shorobindu saying reason is the helper reason is the bar now that logical analytical limited mind can be that room in which we are sitting having the workshop if i remain there seated firmly seated on my seat and yet wanting that if you have seen the divine show me the divine you know or the higher mind or illumined mind it is not a possibility it it divine may give a glimpse definitely people who have powers they may give you a glimpse but the effort has to be mine you know after that glimpse do i want to walk this path of getting out of my outpost mind disengaging disidentifying from the outpost mind and accessing the higher that is 24/7 available but i am so identified with that room in which the workshop is happening that i don't care i don't want to go out i just theorize and intellectualize about it what is higher mind what is over mind and you know, all that so i really uh, that experience when dr reddy was sharing this it came back to me when i was reading these lines in savitri where he is sharing this vastness you know, Uh, that a pos that is a possibility for each one of us so any thoughts here before i share next okay so i'm going to share something extra again if one can call it extra uh, just to delighted to share it so uh, with just a second mm -hmm. so with uh, shri aurobindo uh, and vedas we have in in vedas they say that truth whenever we talk of truth whenever we talk of 
divine three words can be associated it is coming from vedas these three words and they are called satyam ritam and brihat satyam is truth ritam is right and brihat is vastness vast brihat like wide and uh, expansive so these aspects of truth will come whenever we are identified with the truth consciousness so i am going to read a few lines uh, which i to me were very very revelatory they are from kirit joshi's explanation and i can also maybe put it on screen uh, maybe it would be nice for me to put on screen uh, although just a second give me a moment if i can just yeah i'm putting it on a document and put it on the screen so that some of us can go through and then we can reflect over it yeah it's ready yeah i hope you can all see this what i have in the front i'll just make it little bigger yeah so i'll go through a few lines and i'll maybe uh, request later someone to go through it also so he talks about rita and rita he says uh, it's the right you know and we all want to do right action you know what is the right action for me in this moment so he says that people who have studied veda they find this concept idea of rita satyam ritam brahat rita to be one of the most important discoveries they find that rita is not only something that is the highest but is also something that has a dynamic capacity to pull you upwards you know and we say that if you have right company a satsang it pulls you upward you know it uplifts you so this rita right anything right right company right thought right feeling it has the capacity to pull you upwards it is like a pulley it takes you upwards all the time and then he says that in another words dharma which we talk about you know what is my dharma in this situation it is not static it is dynamic so every person would have a different dharma in according to his context and that is why truth is forever evolving it's not a formula that we can put for everyone in words so rita is dynamic it constantly pulls you upwards now this rita was expressed in vedic time through three words satyam ritam brihat all these three are sanskrit words and then he says one day i i'm sure you, you will read learn sanskrit and it will be easier it's uh, transcribed from one of his talks so some comments also come in between yeah and then he talks about satyam explaining what it is satyam is the expression of reality sat is reality satya is the expression exact expression of reality you must have seen that one of the most difficult things for any student is to express accurately many of you are artists and you want to draw a picture and one of the most difficult things is that what you feel inwardly most accurately and you want to bring out that in picture in the image most accurately it is very difficult i remember uh, again sharing one anecdote of my child you know when he was little he had some imagination in mind and he wanted to draw it and he said that while drawing he realized that it's not coming as perfectly as he is seeing it in the mind and he said that mummy my mind my uh, my fingers are not listening to my mind you know so that's where we all have some beautiful imagination but we are not able we are trying our best to express it accurately you know that's what we call our journey towards moving towards more and more perfection so we have a brilliant idea in mind brilliant visualization but the task for us effort is to put it out on paper as beautifully as i see it in the mind so he is talking about that now this exercise if you do in life 
whatever you feel to be true to be real you try to express accurately that is satya you know so many of us are struggling at times that i want harmony in my relationships but i see that there is no harmony so we want to express some harmony and beauty in relationship that's our uh, effort towards expression of satya and but he says but what you feel to be real today is your present experience of real tomorrow as you expand you have another view of true of the real we all have you know these experiences when we were a child we had different vision when we were teenagers there was real something different when we have grown a bit adultish you know now there is something else real for us so this keeps on changing it keeps evolving and he gives a very beautiful example there is a image in the veda if you climb a hill at a certain stage of climbing you have one view and if you climb further you have still a farther view same thing the background remains the same yet the vision changes and then when you reach to the peak you have an overall view overview everything as it were it changes all remains the same and yet all changes so depending upon where is my stance you know i have a different view and for me that view i say is the right view but when i go further when i evolve further i see that again a different view emerges that's also is right so veda says there is no end of peaks and there are peaks and peaks and peaks of reality and sri aurobindo also says that there are realization after realizations greater light after greater light there is no end to this journey so that is the vastness you know the reality is such vast so now we come from satya to brihat so when we were talking of reality which is sat that which exists that which is true we automatically came to vastness you know that is so vast therefore satya is connected with brihat brihat means vast so the veda said whatever you speak of the truth be sure you are the you are vast at the same time so that tells us you know whenever we become too dogmatic too opinionated i am true and you are wrong i am on the spiritual path you are wrong that is not we are not connected with the truth because truth is always connected with vast so if we are actually truly in our being connected with some true spirituality we will become more and more vast more embracing than life shining so whatever you speak of the truth be sure you are vast at the same time because if you are not wa- vast then and yet you speak of the truth it may be a narrow truth it is simply your present perception it's a very limited view i am holding on to you are really able to express the reality only when you are vast so this this is what mother shorobindo says make the mind vast supple and even if we have two opposing point of views one may, must be able to synthesize it in one essay or you know, one uh, synthesis so yes uh, anybody anything here before we take it further okay so i'm going further it's really very beautiful and i wanted to share it in conjunction so then he says in fact shorobindo has given the word all comprehensiveness that is the word shorobindo uses for vast when you are vast everything is comprehended and when you have expressed reality and when that reality is seen in an all comprehensive way then there is rita what he was you know, initially starting with so satyam ritam brihat they are expression of reality accurately expression of reality in all its comprehensiveness when that happens and then whatever is done in action is right so when we are wondering what is what is my uchit karm what should i do in this situation and all that we do is we always think from our limited sense mind and that's why we are never able to truly take a right action you know uchit karm whatever action we take it must mostly disturb someone you know so 
So then he talks about very interesting thing. He says that we often find that we have constantly a question, is it a right action or a wrong action? How many people are quarreling on this question? It is wrong, it is right, you know, what to do? Now in Vedas, we have the answer. In Vedas, the answer is that you are both right and wrong until you reach a point where you have seen the reality in all comprehensiveness. Because as we were seeing that when we are climbing, 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 at whatever stage I am seeing the view, that view is an okay view. We can't say that it's a wrong view. But once we reach the peak, then we say, wow, you know, this is something extraordinary. You know, this I never imagined. So before that peak is reached, which is a long, 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 long way, you know, journey after journey, we are all right and we are all wrong at the same time. So when action proceeds without this comprehensive reality, it is not necessarily the right action. So all of us in one way or the other, always are taking half right, half wrong action. <laughs> it's, it's never truly a right action. So then he says, only he can perform the right action who has gone to the reality and to the comprehensive reality and attained to the vision of comprehensive reality and from there proceeded into the action like an arrow, like there is no confusion, like an arrow, you do that action. You know, if you know that's what it's required in that moment, like the action of Sri Krishna, he knows what is exactly required in that situation. There is no doubt about that action. And to other people, it may appear immoral, not moral, not ethical, but Krishna knows what he's doing. He has that consciousness. And then he says something really very, very, again, very powerful. He says that uh, Rita, when we were talking of Rita, is coming from this German word called Recht. Those of us who may have exposure to German, Recht is right for German. So you want to take a right, you say Ich gehe Recht. So Recht means which is straight. And right action is always a straight action. It's a very transparent action. And he says that there is no crookedness in it. It's a very transparent action. You're not manipulating. You're not trying to be something else and inwardly feeling something else. Now he says all human beings, somehow they try to manipulate to arrive at their end. We all have manipulations in our mind. What will I get out of it? Oh, what will the other person think out of this? You know, so all this is going on in the commentary. Because we are so ignorant, we are so ignorant we want to achieve this thing, that thing, whatever we see, we want to possess you know, our stickiness. We don't know why we do this. No? We are so small in our normal condition. We are like small children. You see a toy, you want to have that toy with you. You see another, you want to put it in your mouth. We are like small children. As you rise into adulthood, as you become bigger and bigger, you find that all these movements are crooked actions. They are manipulative actions. You are obliged to take some kind of winding paths to achieve what you want. Right action is a straight action. There is no debate about it. It is a straight. It is straight action. Coming right from the vision of truth, everything is straight. So when we talk about you know, having a simple mind, a simple living, a lighter living, this is where it comes boils down to. So we are when you are, we are united more and more to the truth consciousness, we live our life simply without manipulations. Now we don't want anything from this material existence. There is no manipulative hidden demands hidden in my actions and speech. And then there is something which I can maybe put it on the group later because maybe this is enough for today. Yeah, anyone, anything to share? Yes, yeah, sir. you know, one thing that comes to me that I see again and again that although I say big things, you know, I say I want, I want the truth. I, I don't know, take session, I, you know, come to sessions. And yet there's something in me which is very set in its ways, you know, like I know that I have to learn, 
and be more and yet i feel there so much in me that is right as in you know i am already sitting on a throne and i want to be i don't know have a bigger and higher and vaster throne and i have full images and notions about what that higher would look like like so many times you know when we hear something we are like fighting because the, my limited self feels to but this is right right that the train that i am on is the right train like somehow that thing that you know i don't know what is right like let me i don't know you know like i'm always willing to just accept that okay is this all wrong or yes this is wrong and you know show me the right i feel there is often a lack of that like i come from a position of very strong a belief that i am right i i'm sorry i'm just repeating myself so yeah. basically for me to for this to dawn into me mm. there has to be this thing that i don't know you know yeah. that yeah. you have a child often yeah oh i think she got disconnected Yeah, anyone who wants to share in the meantime, if there is anything. Okay, so I'm just going to. I think what Taru was sharing, uh, it's uh, the three gunas uh, were coming when she was sharing that we talk about tamas, uh, rajas, and satwa these three gunas and yes yeah, she's back yeah taru yeah sorry i don't know what yeah yeah, yeah actually so i wanted to patient. just yeah. wanted to add on to what you were sharing you know and okay, why okay. this is there why this is there what you were sharing because uh, they talk about these three gunas you know tamas rajas and satwa and satwa is considered to be the highest or the elite most guna uh, satvik state as we talk about satvik food and all that and then we have the trishul of the shiva where we see that even the, we have to abandon satva and transcend basically not abandon we have to transcend satva also because that is also a limitation so what you were sharing is uh, when the consciousness goes towards satva so tamasic state would be i am living in patterns and i am not even admitting to myself that there is something lacking in my life and there is something which i am missing and I, as if there is this dullness and you know routine in my life which i am just set with like there is lot of you know the, what we say like tamas is opposite of peace it looks like peace but it is not so we are settled as the settlement that you were talking of and we all are composed of these three gunas so one person may be more satvik but it doesn't mean that the tamas is not present in him you see in many domains in my life tamas is present and so that's where we see this dullness coming and pulling me down you know, the this tamas and then there is rajas so rajas is considered for example better than tamas and again i'm sharing just a very little window and i'm sure people will have more idea about these gunas but just in the context of what taru was sharing so rajas would be you know having passions you know okay i want to enjoy okay let me go out and follow a passion you know living luxuriously with beauty like rajasik gunas you know having ambitions so there they they consider that it is better uh, from a tamasic state that at least i move you know, at least it makes me move and we all all have our own areas where we feel we are more rajasik we all have our areas where we are more tamasic and then there is a state where there is slowly in greater degree there is a realization what taru was sharing that i realize that oh my god i really don't have a clue but i would want to know now that receptivity that porosity can be uh, you know uh, shared or referred to as satva and that is why satvik guna is considered more like you know it's open to grace it's more like receptive i am now i know that i am weak but i don't want to stay there i want to move on 
from my weakness. I want to transcend my weakness. I know that I'm ignorant, but I'm conscious of my ignorance. And I want to listen to those people or those, you know, Veda scriptures, which talk about knowledge. So there is an openness. And then one says that they, they say that you have to go beyond the sattva even. Now, how would I go, go beyond the sattva? Because when I am in the sattvic uh, guna, completely there, if one can say, still there is a me. Who am I? I am the one who is ignorant and I am the one who is seeking truth. So this I is still there. Now, when we look at Shiva's Trishul, he says that, okay, I have this Trishul in hand, which kills all these gunas. It goes beyond the gunas. And that's where we have the absolute you know, truth, the complete union merger with the divine consciousness at all aspects of our being, where there is not even the need of sattvicity left. There is complete, as in prayers and meditation, mother says that I am right now referring to myself as I and you as thou. So there is a, as if there is a difference. But I know very soon a stage will come when I would not refer to you as thou, when whenever I am saying I, it is you that I am talking of. You know, so the divine completely lives your life. So that would be again, again, just, just my reflection, not take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, you know, that would be transcending all these three gunas. So when uh, you were sharing about why I am like this, you know, so set and I, Something in me feels like I am okay the way I am, you know, because it's we are always a mixture of tamas, rajas, and sattva, and they're always fluid, like they're changing. And yeah, that's it. That's what I wanted to share. Yeah, anything more? Anyone? All right. So maybe we can take last bit. Uh, I think I extended this one a bit too much and see where we go. Maybe we can take this whole together. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who would like to read? Just a second. I'm just putting it on. Yeah. Yeah, Raviji? Yeah. I'll. Aware of his occult omnipotent source, allured by the omniscient ecstasy, a living center of the illimitable, widened to equate with the world's circumference. He turned to his immense spiritual faith, abandoned on a canvas of torn air, a picture lost in fire and fading streaks. The earth's nature's summits sank below his feet. He climbed to meet the infinite more above. Yeah, thank you so much. So now he's, uh, he's aware of his omnipotent souls, you know, all powerful souls. Now, what happens with us mostly is that uh, we are not aware. So we have unawareness in life. We have ignorance in our life. And uh, when we put effort, then in, we see that in greater and greater degrees, we are able to see that change in our consciousness. But most of the times we live identified with this mortality. Who am I? I am this limited being who will die when the body dies. That's who I am. Who am I? I am this limited being who has this and this parents, this and this lineage and this and this conditioning. That's it. That's what who I am. But he did not identify himself with this limitation. He identified himself now. He was aware of his occult, omnipotent source, all powerful source. Who am I? I am the child of the all powerful Divine Mother. You know, in one talk, uh, Dr. Alok Pandey was sharing, which I found very beautiful. He said that we all have our uh, identifications you know this is my identity card and this is who I am I am the son of so and so businessman he was sharing and uh, my mother is you know this elite person and my father is this and then there is a person who says I am the child of divine mother <laughs> so <laughs> so he was sharing that you know uh, we uh, become so proud and you know want to expand you know, 
the idea is to feel expanded you know even when i'm sharing i am the son of this and this businessman or this and this lineage the idea is to feel expanded but when we say that not only say outwardly but we realize in ourselves that yes it's true you know we are all children of all powerful divine mother what can stop us what can stop us but i think here we need to put effort because by default i identify myself with the limited so now if i want to change my identification i will have to put effort you know, it, that's why we do meditations that's why we do our daily prayers because we want to break this pattern of identifying with the limited so now he's aware of his all powerful source that he is the son of you know, the god he, he is the divine so he's aware of his omnipotent source allured by the omniscient ecstasy is now very attracted towards this delight this joy true joy true bliss he's delighted he's like a magnet attracts iron fillings you know he's like that he's pulled towards that source of his origin a living center of the illimitable now again reflect over it you know again a very meditative line a living center of the illimitable now usually whenever we talk of center we have a circle around now, okay this is the circle this is the circumference and this is where the center is so we always have a limited circumference and then there is a center now what he is sharing is that yes there is a center but it is the center of illimitable like we were talking of this infinite space that when we go in outer space galaxies after galaxies illimitable and when the circle is illimitable if we can call it a circle then the center can be also infinite because everywhere there is a center because there is no periphery so each one of us each being is a living center of that infinity just meditate upon it for a moment and see your expanse that expands into outer space planets after planets and you know going beyond outer space for this reach of the scientist and we i am the center i am a living center of that infinity that's who i am that's empowering and there are many many centers we are all centers of that illimitable widened to equate with the world's circumference so this expansion that we talk we were talking of brihat the vastness that's how expanded he became he widened his being to equate with the world's circumference so everything like is in his being he's not limited and then there is extension of that limit he is just all embracing all powerful is united with that source he turned to his immense spiritual fate so now being aware of this omnipotent source that he is coming from knowing that he is not a limited suffocated being he is something very powerful which he has just realized he now turned from his lesser reality to a greater reality what is my lesser reality all the mundane regularity of life which pulls me down pulls me down pulls me down most often than not we are involved in very trivial matters and starting from our thought you know look at our thought our thought is where is it engaged you know, if we make a log of where is my thought engaged 24 hours a day we will see where is it engaged so now he was able to just turn back towards this limited and suffocating living and he turned to his immense spiritual faith and this is what each one of us has to do each one of us has to realize that this world of material existence what we demand from it this lasting satisfaction lasting joy it cannot be gotten until we all actually become united with our true divine godhead within and then we can 
spill out that beauty and fragrance in this world also that's our task you know each one of us is a living center of that illimitable but first i will have to know i'll have to be that illimitable so that's how he expanded and then he like shot like an arrow like a you know how these space shuttles go into they leave nasa or these isro you know the space stations and then they march out into the outer space so like that he marched out towards the infinity abandoned on a canvas of torn air a picture lost in far and fading streaks the earth nature summits sank below his feet so he expanded so high in his realizations that the limited earth nature was not able to bind him now you know how would you have the view when in you are in a space shuttle and you are looking down below at earth now those buildings and you know those little little cages cannot bind you you are far above with this throttle and propulsion that you have got you are far 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 above so those earth nature summits they sank below his feet you know like he left those limitations and suffocated uh, ways of living far below he climbed to meet the infinite more above so he took off like this rocket and he entered into this vastness the truth consciousness that we were uh, talking of in with kirit joshi he went to meet that truth and to unite with it and to gain understanding from that and then it is a description later on on what he goes through when he's what he has to go through when he's uh, shooting like an arrow or going like a rocket towards higher and higher realization yeah. so anything here anyone all right so i'm assuming nothing at the moment so we'll take up uh, next time from this page page 79 and yeah thank you everyone for joining